This video is brought to you by Storyblocks. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. This is girl math. Everything I buy with a gift card is free. If I buy something, but then I return it, I've made money. And this is boy math. Boy math is packing zero pairs of underwear, but 72 beers for a three day camping trip. <laughs> oh, and of course, gender. It affects how we dress, the color of our razors, whether we can hug our bros without saying no homo, and maybe even our ability to count. But today, traditional gender is under attack by This is our country, aye, aye, aye. When a queen is a queen, she don't need no cowboy. Gender issues are sweeping the nation, with no child being safe from this. The hips on the drag queen go swish, swish, swish. The outcry today is mostly focused on trans and other gender non-conforming folks, who apparently pose dangers that Chaya Rychik of Libs of TikTok struggled to clearly articulate in a recent interview. The whole thing is based off of a lie, and I think that this lie cannot be mainstream in our, in our society. It's just, it's a lie. At the same time, we're seeing anxiety about a supposed liberal attack on traditional gender roles. I just think the message that the left has sent men in this country for decades now is that they're trash. And as Tucker Carlson freaks out about the collapse of male testosterone levels, TikTok tradwives lament the tragedy of women having jobs. If you are not familiar with the term tradwife, it is a woman who chooses to live a more traditional life with ultra traditional gender roles. Which has us wondering, why is gender such a hot button issue right now? Where does our fixation on traditional gender roles come from? And was it inevitable? And why does the simple existence of trans folks make people so angry and worried and scared. Seen complaining about a woman she believes to be transgender using the woman's bathroom. Her husband, a middle school vice principal in Neptune, New Jersey, becomes so irate he throws beer at the people recording them. Okay, so sex and gender get confused a lot. So let's start with defining some terms. According to the World Health Organization, sex refers to the different biological and physiological characteristics of females, males, and intersex persons, such as chromosomes, hormones, and reproductive organs. It defines gender as the socially constructed characteristics of women and men, such as norms, roles, and relationships. To make this like really simple, one is biological and the other is everything else. Now, lots of people view gender as a binary. We're born male or female, and that's how nature intended it. But this isn't really borne out in the animal kingdom where many species are intersex, and fungi can have thousands of sexes. A scholar Myra Heard writes, the majority of living organisms on this planet could make little sense of the human classification of two sexes. And if you're thinking, Michael, come on, I'm not, I'm not a mushroom, I'm a human. Well, know that our genetics don't fully support that binary either. As Mary Hawksworth writes, more than 25 genes affect sex development, contributing to a patchwork of genetically distinct cells within one body, some of which may have a different sex than the rest. Given the biological complexities of sex and gender, it makes sense that historically, humans weren't really wedded to a binary. Okay, before we keep going, I wanna tell you about today's sponsor, who I'm very excited about, Storyblocks. Storyblocks curated stock library has everything you need to create high quality videos in one place with over a million pieces of 4K HD footage, templates, music, sound effects, images, and more. You can also choose from thousands of pre-made professional video templates for your favorite editing program, including After Effects, Premiere Pro, Apple Motion, and DaVinci Resolve to take your videos to the next level and of course, speed up your creative workflow. Now you can choose a monthly or annual plan with no hidden or extra fees. And with unlimited downloads, you can easily test out different effects, clips, or tracks to bring your creative vision to life. And new content is added regularly, prioritizing in-demand keywords, so you always have what you need to stay current with trends and news. Many other stock providers make licensing expensive and complicated. And that's why Storyblocks created two clear cut licenses with comprehensive coverage so you can get back the time you'd spend wading through legal jargon and just create with confidence. Here at Wisecrack, and this is real guys, we legit love Storyblocks. Between you and me, there was a time where we were only able to use free stock footage and Creative Commons footage, and we had to scour the web for hours. It ate up so much time, caused a lot of headaches. If you've ever been in that position, you know what we mean when we say that Storyblocks can truly feel like a breath of fresh air. Now to get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one set price, head to storyblocks.com wisecrack. Click the link in the description. Again, that's Storyblocks. 
www.wisecrack.com slash wisecrack, or there is a link in the description. Okay, now let's get back to the show. As far back as 2500 BC, we have evidence of gender fluidity in grave sites. While there's also evidence that one ancient Roman emperor, Elagabalus, asked to be addressed as a woman and sought out surgical sex reassignment. Many non-Western societies have long embraced gender fluidity, from the Mahu in Hawaii to the Sacrata of Madagascar. More than 150 different pre-colonial Native American tribes acknowledged third genders, according to the Human Rights Campaign. And today, many still embrace two-spirit people who engage with both feminine and masculine traits, like activities and attire, and are often treated as a distinct gender category. Now, this suggests that gender is culturally constructed. And if you've ever taken a gender studies course, if you live in a state where they're allowed to teach those still, then this isn't news. In her iconic text, Gender Trouble, scholar Judith Butler argues that gender reality is performative, which means quite simply that it is real only to the extent that it is performed. Rather than womanness or manness being something essential, there are identities that we affirm every day, whether by wearing makeup, taking your buddies out hunting, or winning drag bingo. Butler concludes, the various acts of gender creates the idea of gender. And without those acts, there would be no gender at all. Gender is thus a construction that regularly conceals its genesis. But if gender is a performance, why do we treat it like an absolute essence? Many scholars date our current conceptions of gender back to the 17th and 18th centuries, when the Enlightenment foregrounded natural science over theology and used biological sex as a basis for a gender economy. Thus, according to historian Thomas Lacour, it's really a modern phenomenon to expect gender and sexuality to be a strict, stable binary. It'd be like this, always. And I'd come home to you every night. And you'd be waiting there. Oh, I would, would I? Any old time I stay home all day waiting for a man. Yeah, but lots of girls do, dear. Now, buddy, you've been reading your fairy tales again. Now, the French Revolution perpetuated this ideology. As political scientist and gender theorist Mary Hawksworth explains, revolutionaries embraced the idea that men and women's sexual differences meant they should have different political rights and roles, and any transgression was a risk to organized society. Under France's feudal rule, class had mostly determined your destiny. But the dawn of republicanism was about re-empowering all people who were men. As Hawksworth writes, the male Republican political agenda encompassed not only the revolutionary overthrow of the monarchy, but the domestication of women. Whereas French women had previously enjoyed independence and power in public realms, the embrace of sexual difference now restricted them to the domestic. Now, we're definitely not saying ideas around gender or different treatment of men and women didn't exist prior to this. Only that the modern iteration of gender that we take for granted wasn't formalized in this way until this moment in time. Ever since, the gender dichotomy has been a powerful mechanism for social control, using reproductive roles to organize our lives, ranging from division of labor to legal rights. And this binary was exported via colonization. Europeans viewed their rigid gender roles as a sign of their righteous civilization and violently applied those standards to colonies in Africa, Asia, and the Americas that had long granted women political power or embraced trans identities and queer relationships. And this enforcement wasn't just for colonies. As starting in the late 19th century, American society substantially expanded its legal authority. New local, state, and federal laws were enacted to govern sexuality and gender, including laws banning cross-dressing and regulating things like marital relations and reproductive health. This represented a radical new level of government interference in the most intimate parts of our lives. By 1912, half of the 100,000 prisoners in Chicago were locked up for violating laws that hadn't existed just about 25 years earlier, mostly laws about morality or sexuality. The legal apparatus, along with social pressures and expectations, strongly consolidated gendered differences and norms, making them appear natural. I mean it! This time I'm serious! Go out, get yourself a job, get it out of your system, once and for all. What do you mean, get it out of my system? Once you start working, you'll find out that it's just as humdrum and boring as being a housewife. Nothing is as humdrum and boring as being a housewife. Since then, there have been waves of concern about deviations from those norms. Like when women wanted to get credit cards without their husband's permission, or two married men wanted to adopt kids. When I was in the Congress of the United States and I applied for an American Express card, they said I couldn't get one unless my husband signed. For it. So the strict gender binary is a relatively new cultural construct and not some unavoidable natural order, but it's become normalized. Still, even that doesn't explain why ongoing concerns about gender and especially transness have reached a fever pitch. Now, many seem 
to see any person who excuse the natural gender binary as a bigger threat to kids than guns or, or vaping or Logan Paul branded energy drinks. Because obviously including your pronouns in a work email is just as dangerous as an endless wave of American school shootings. And these anxieties have material effects. Trans legislation tracker says it followed 589 anti-trans bills in 47 states in 2023, a 3,000% increase since just 2015. This didn't materialize out of nowhere. Organizations like Alliance Defending Freedom, the Family Research Council, and the American Principles Project have spent millions of dollars backing parental rights bills to prevent minors from going to drag shows or trans youth from receiving gender affirming care or participating in sports. This isn't new. Queer people have long been an easy scapegoat for broader social anxieties about gender. We saw this in response to the huge disruption of gender and sexual norms caused by World War II, as well as in growing Cold War anxieties that the only way to beat the commies was to socially engineer a prospering nation of leave it to beaver families. I mean, real quick, if you've never heard of the show Leave It to Beaver before, let me know in the comments what you think it's about, right? What would a show called Leave It to Beaver be about. I'm excited to read these. This all catalyzed a panic about so-called sexual psychopaths, a term that equated gay men with pedophiles and led to the passing of a nationwide wave of legislation like the Miller Law, which essentially outlawed sex between men in Washington, D.C. Psychiatry was essential to justifying these new violent restrictions on mid-century Americans' most intimate freedoms, like when the American Psychiatric Association classified homosexuality as a sociopathic personality disturbance. Now, this is an example of what Michel Foucault called biopower, or the way modern nation states have controlled their populations through an explosion of numerous and diverse techniques for achieving the subjugations of bodies. In other words, bodily control to ensure compliance. Uh, if you wanna know more about this concept, we made a video about biopower in the context of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It's not a joke, it's a video we made, go check it out. While much of this is done through punishment and discipline, the medicalization of many human phenomena, in this case, homosexuality, is a crucial aspect of biopower because it presents things like queerness as medical or psychological problems in need of fixing. As historian and author Regina Kunzel writes, the regulation, surveillance, and criminalization of intimate life was facilitated and also masked by the discourse of medicine and the language of illness, treatment, and cure. At the time, psychiatry grew incredibly powerful in large part because of its perceived authority to solve the problems caused by sexual and gender nonconformity. Locked up in psychiatric hospitals across the country, queer patients were treated with electroshock therapy, solitary confinement, sedatives, and so-called aversion therapy, where they were given a paralyzing medication, all to extract the gay from their bodies. Now, historically, queer panic always comes with a heavy dose of, we gotta protect the children, which is a sentiment that we've heard a lot of lately. I'm one of you. I moved from New York, where I had lived my entire life, to Florida to protect my children. The progressive left is using sexual identity issues as a bulldozer. They've run over the educational establishment and they're coming for your house. Today we see the same medicalized demonization applied to transness and a biopolitical desire to control trans bodies, allegedly all for the sake of the nation and its children. According to journalist and activist Amara Jones, the seeds of today's anti-trans movement began around 2008. Not coincidentally, this was the same time public sentiment towards gay people was starting to become more positive, a trend that would continue to grow in part due to successful activism for rights like marriage and gay adoption, i.e. rights that allowed queer people to conform to nuclear familial expectations. I don't know. I guess I feel different than a lot of people. Well, sweetie, that is one thing your dad and I can relate to. I guess well, that's the great thing about having two gay dads. We, we know what it feels like to be an outsider. Activists who opposed LGBTQ rights turned their attention to transness, focusing on proving that it was a made-up identity, a delusion, and a mental illness. They did this primarily through funding pseudoscientific organizations that conducted dubious research. In this way, they anticipated the growing visibility of gender nonconformity that was on the horizon. As transness gained more cultural recognition in the 2010s, these groups used their research to frame it as a social contagion. As Amar Jones points out, the scientific approach to disproving transness as an identity is incredibly effective because it erases the element of hate from transphobia and reframes it as trusting the science because you're not a bigot, 
You're a scientist. The Human Biodiversity Institute, considered a neo-eugenicist organization, came up with the term autogynephilia to describe the mental disorder of trans identity, arguing that it arises from men experiencing sexual arousal when picturing themselves as a woman. In recent years, the term rapid onset gender dysphoria, ROGD, has risen to popularity. It's the idea that transness is a social contagion. So you had a you had a tough childhood in some ways. Can you walk us through some of that before this fake light bulb went on of gee, I, I'm in the wrong body and I think I need to be a boy. Kids and adults for that matter aren't actually trans, but are being convinced they are by YouTube videos, TikTok influencers, edgy peers, medical professionals, and liberal educators trying to indoctrinate children. I'll tell you guys, at least when it comes to YouTube videos, it's hard to get y'all to, you know, sign up for our Patreon, let alone convince you that you have a different gender identity. But you know, if you want to prove me wrong, there's a link in the description. Thus allowing minors to receive gender affirming care is dangerous because it's a phase and one they'll surely regret when the winds of culture change. As such, they must be protected from this contagion and its effects. This echoes the long-standing hysteria around equating queerness with contagion and a word that rhymes with metadelia, which we're seeing play out yet again in the discourse around trans bathroom usage. There were some who had a different stance. If everyone can be a woman, then no one is a woman. We are not gonna bow down to your gender ideology cult. We're not, you're fantasy land. As Matt Sharp of Alliance Defending Freedom, which provides legal support for such legislation said, it's a sense of urgency. What can we do to protect the children? I'll tell you one thing we, we can't do, we can't pass tougher gun regulation or offer universal child health care. can't do that. I can't fund uh, teachers more to make uh, schools better and have smaller class sizes. And we can't make education free after college so that young people don't go, we can't do any of that. But this bathroom thing, my man Matt Sharp has it all figured out. And for many in the parents' rights movement, pseudoscience has replaced the actual science. Despite puberty blockers and other gender-affirming treatments having been used and tested for over four decades, parents are made to feel like their children are being treated as guinea pigs for experimental drugs or surgeries. Here, it's very important to note that trans youth do not receive medical treatment until adolescence, when they may start receiving hormone therapy or puberty blockers, the latter of which simply delays puberty with effects that are entirely reversible. It's extremely rare for a trans teenager under 18 to receive any kind of surgical care. I do remember when I was in high school, a lot of people under 18, all of a sudden, like, a lot of people had deviated septums, but, you know, surgery, it is what it is. And listen, medical care often sucks, and it's understandable that people are wary of it, but this doesn't feel like good faith questioning. For critics of the transgender trend, like British psychotherapist Stephanie Davies Arai, doctors are fueling the promotion of gender ideology for some unnamed gains, despite she asserts the fact that gender identity is a new and untested theory that contradicts all we know about child adolescent development and psychology. But this is all pretty misleading. ROGD and social contagion theories have been formally disproven. And the idea that trans people are wrong about their identity simply isn't borne out in the data. One Dutch study of nearly 7,000 trans folks found a rate of regret for gender affirming treatment in general to be even less than 1% and zero amongst youth who receive such care. Even when it comes to transgender surgeries, they are along with breast reduction, among the least regretted surgeries in the US, with only a 1% rate of regret, as compared to a 30% regret rate for knee surgery. Fun fact, I have a friend that had knee surgery. She got real depressed afterwards, so, so I can see that. She's doing okay now, but afterwards, that was not good. While about 13.1% of respondents to a 2021 national transgender study reported having detransitioned at some point in their life, it doesn't necessarily translate to regret. In fact, 82.5% of those respondents cited external factors like pressure from a parent or increased vulnerability to violence is their reason for detransitioning. Despite all this, convincing people that transgender is not a valid identity worthy of protection has worked. In 2022, 60% of Americans told Pew that a person's gender is determined by their sex assigned at birth, up from 56% in 2021 and 54% in 2017. Notably, 44% of Americans say science had a great deal or a fair amount of influence on their opinion. And as increasing numbers of Americans view gender as a biological fact, we're seeing a simultaneous rise in support for restrictions on trans rights. For example, 43% support making it a crime to provide gender-affirming care to minors 
years, a 15% increase since just 2021. And shifting public sentiments materially make life more dangerous for trans people. For example, murder rates for trans folks doubled from just 2017 to 2021. Now we understand how the anti-trans movement is built on both the Western gender binary and the tradition of using pseudoscience to demonize queer folks. But why is this still working on us when support for queer rights in general has never been higher? Well, to answer that, it's worth asking what the existence of trans, gender, queer, or non-binary folks does in a society that's been fundamentally organized around a stable gender binary. If gender is a performance, the binary needs all of us to be part of its, you know, proverbial theater troupe. And by refusing, trans and non-binary people destabilize the show. I, I thought you had a lot of work to do. Well, Dad, I was thinking, you know, term papers and exams come and go, but the family unit is the one true constant in life. But why is it so threatening to some people when someone else questions the binary. Well, we can better understand this by returning to biopower, which has been used to enforce the gender binary in the field of medicine and beyond. That binary is inextricable from systems of biopower, which have made a project of, according to civil rights attorney Jillian Todd Weiss, transforming social custom into legal control mechanisms, a sort of natural law theory of gender. Scholars Paisley Curra and Lisa Jean Moore explain that despite being in perpetual crisis, the gender binary is actually preserved by the legal machinations the state requires of its people. From the moment you're given a birth certificate, your gender is enormously important to how you're categorized by the state. Because of this, sociologist Zine Magubani has argued that antagonism towards people who don't conform to the gender binary comes from a perceived difficulty to classify them in a society that requires citizens to be either man or woman to participate. In other words, trans and non-conforming bodies are seen as difficult to govern. But what end does governing gender serve? Well, according to Judith Butler, it normalizes heterosexuality in the service of reproductive interest, meaning it helps ensure that lots of us make lots of babies, which coincidentally has the effect of creating more future laborers to serve the capitalist economy. Indeed, scholar Stephen Viter notes that the meaning of family has historically been defined less by the functions it fulfills for its members than the function it serves for the state, i.e. producing and raising children who will be loyal little workers. Trans folks threaten the state's ability to fully control reproduction by raising questions like whether they can reproduce or who does what in the realm of reproduction. For example, trans men getting pregnant. Lee Edelman's book, No Future, which we talked about in our video on antinatalism, gets into this uh, in detail. So check out that video or just read Edelman's book if you wanna know more. Scholar Vivian Namaste argues that in a state defined by binaries, trans people have been viewed as a sign of decay. Trans folks have, as scholars, Vec Lewis argues, been treated as obstacles to progress and modernity. Backward, uncivilized, they are perceived as a threat to the harmony of the imagined social corpus and theorized as a contamination of the national body. If the word contamination in the same breath as national body felt a little bit like you were getting a, a tickle from Hitler's mustache, well, you're spot on because Nazi Germany is the perfect example of the backlash that can ensue when queer folks become too visible and threatening to the status quo. After World War I, Germany is Weimar Republic witnessed a sexual revolution that saw Berlin become the queer capital of Europe. Queer bars, clubs, and publications fostered a vibrant community, including the world's first trans clinic, the Institute for Sexual Research, which performed the first modern gender-affirming surgery. While queer visibility certainly wasn't the reason Hitler came to power, his regime violently cracked down on the community. They shut down the nightclubs and magazines and systematically persecuted queer folks, deporting many to concentration camps. Famously, the Institute for Sexual Research was destroyed its archives burned in the streets by Nazi students. Oh, sorry, wrong clip. That wasn't from then. That was from a few weeks ago. And I'll just say like, you know, we're open-minded, have the views you want, but if the thing you're doing is a thing that the Nazis also did, I would at least stop and be like, do I want to do the same thing that the Nazis did? And then say, no, and go inside. Take a bath. Trans scholars today frequently evoke the Weimar Republic as the most extreme manifestation of the fact that, as Butler puts it, gender is a performance with clearly punitive consequences. And those punishments seem to only increase with larger queer visibility. In our current climate, folks who like to cross-dress or trans people who try to use the bathroom of their choice often risk targeted violence. And trans folks experience a myriad of other legal, social, and medical repercussions. But this doesn't just affect queer people. The potential punishments for transgressing gendered expectations 
affects how we all behave. We perform our gender identities not solely because they're natural or inherent in us, but because of a society that sometimes violently regulates and enforces them, a process we're hardly cognizant of until someone challenges it. These identities foster rigid expectations of gender, or as social psychologist Brian Nosek and his team of researchers put it, social realities shape minds. Conforming to gender roles out of fear of punishment, even if it just looks like getting roasted for tearing up in kindergarten, because of course boys don't cry, necessarily changes how we think about ourselves and how we assess other people. This is why Foucault saw sexuality, which for him included gender, as the intersection of the individual and collective, and thus said it effectively supplies the capillary space of power circulation throughout the biopoliticized populace. I spent an hour and a half teaching one of our girls what she needed to know in order to start on the oscilloscope today. This morning, she isn't here. All these things you've been talking about, marriage, absenteeism, personality problems, aren't they really just a part of life? Part of a woman's life, maybe. Hence, while gender sure feels like our most private business, it gets constructed as a societal issue. Gender and sex roles are incredibly potent ways to control a population and ensure it continues to reproduce. Transness and gender nonconformity confounds our ability to classify people in the simplest way for reproductive ends. And when people get uncomfortable about this, they blame trans people instead of their own social programming. Challenging binaries is particularly fraught in the West, which according to anthropologist Michelle Rolf Trio, based its modernity almost entirely on binaries. As Trio explains, enlightenment era thinking was predicated on a system of binaries like nature versus culture, mind versus body, good versus evil, and so on. Since then, philosophers like Jacques Derrida have challenged the simplicity of binaries as a system via deconstruction, which he used to reveal both the interdependence and power relations implicit in every binary. And these ideas often get associated with postmodernism. For example, French revolutionary men couldn't establish themselves as superior without relying on the binary opposite of woman to call their inferior. If postmodernism destabilized binaries intellectually without completely overthrowing them, transness does the same on a more immediate level in the course of our everyday lives. If man and woman are not the innate categories we think they are, what other binaries might be up for challenge? Trans people have the potential to undermine structures of power that govern our gender and thus our lives. And this of course raises questions about other binaries. And that's what makes it so dangerous to folks like Jordan Peterson, who coincidentally hates Jacques Derrida and postmodern thought. Um, if you wanna learn more about that, we actually have a video breaking it down that you can check out. But what do you all think? I would genuinely love to know what you guys think in the comments, but I would also ask that we avoid, you know, some of the, the vitriol that sometimes happens when we talk about things like this. So, you know, just like be cool. But thank you so much for watching, for hanging out, for commenting, for liking, for subscribing. It means a lot to us. We say it every time, but it just gets more and more true. And a huge shout out to all of our patrons. Seriously, thank you so much. Your support helps us become way less dependent on algorithms and ads and the friggin' fluctuations of the free market. If you've thought about joining, but like most of us, you're kind of broke, we have a new $1 level that you can jump in on. It's a way for you just to basically be like, hey, I like what you guys do. Here's a dollar. And if you sign up for a full year, it's only $10.80. What a deal. What a deal. In the meantime, I don't know, just like hang out and have a nice day, right? There's lots of stuff to get stressed about. A lot of our recent videos can be a little bit of a bummer. So, you know, just, just have a nice day. That's what I want for you. And I'll see you next time.